Dimitri Rivero. I'm so excited to have you on the show. And I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> You're such a class act. You came, you brought, you brought me wine. You are the first guest ever to be on the show and bring wine. I don't drink, only on rare special occasions. And I don't drink either, so what is this? <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna have this wine here. We'll open it right now. We'll open okay. it right now. You can tell that I'm not good at this. No, you know what? Let me do it. Hold on. Just a little bit more probably, like yeah. that. I think we're these wings come it. out. Yeah, and you press on it. Wow, my Eastern European colleagues would be so disappointed in me. <laughs> This was a recommended one, so I hope it tastes good. I'm sure it's amazing. And this is perfect because the type of music that you uh, perform is of the highest level, beautiful music. And I've seen a lot of your videos, beautiful stages with so many people mm -hmm. and always dress up to the nines, very fancy. So I think wine is perfect companion yeah. drink. For that it's like they say it's not mcdonald's it's a five-star restaurant uh -huh. <laughs> just like with music cheers it's soft yeah i i'm not i don't know about wine but it's, it's not strong. i think this is argentinian okay it's not the most famous wine but quality wise that it was recommended yeah i think it's from uh the region of mendoza it is very good have you ever been to argentina no but i have many friends that i have met in from Argentina, uh, in cons in a conservatory where I studied in yeah. in New York, and uh, they're some of the most talented people I have I have met. Yeah, actually, I, one of the videos I watched of you was the tango, mm -hmm. the, the tango of Roxanne. Am I right? Roxanne, yeah. Tell me about that song. Well, the thing is that tango, historically, it it, it was I don't know I don't know exactly what was the story behind it, but part of it one of the influences was uh, the singer and composer Sting. And it's really? based on, the, um, on this famous song, um, Roxanne, Don't Come Out Tonight, or something like this. I don't know the pop song that Sting did, but basically on that, based on that song, they made this musical that's called Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge, yeah. And then... Uh, they have the film too. Yes, exactly. And then part of that musical is this it's not so much a song as a scene where these two men are in love with this with this woman um, and basically they're telling her not to go out and sell her body to the night. Both men have different reasons for what they are saying, uh, but she has conquered their heart just the same. And so what I did in this uh, piece of music is that I, I actually created myself that choreography. Uh, where we invited a dancer, a female dancer with another male dancer, mm -hmm. and that basically she's going between the, the other singer, me, and the dancer, and she's keeping us all three miserable. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. every good tango, it's very dramatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What is it with us, like Hispanic people, like, yeah. and Latin in general, that we love like that passion and like drama and like... I think it's, it might, partly might be the weather, Okay. Because also, even if if a lot of it came from Spain, uh, it's a, one of the southern countries from Europe. There's more heat there. Uh, also, uh, in Latin America, it is also the fusion of African rhythms that contributed to that um, that passion, I would say. Yeah. And um, rhythms like tango, for example, it was not welcome before. Tango was a dance that men would dance with men but also it would happen in, in brothels. In so the, in men Argent would dance with men? With men, yes, but it was also a dance that was propagated in, not, in the not so nice neighborhoods of Buenos Aires. Really? And uh, this music was not welcome for a long time. Uh, just like jazz, actually. Jazz was a... Like underground. Very, underground, right? secluded, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not music for nice, civilized, you know, people. But then, then it got popularized, then the King of Tango came out, the now known King of Tango, which is Carlos Gardel, maybe you've heard of him. Yeah. He was huge during the 20s. He flew to Hollywood, actually, to Los Angeles. He made some movies. So he made tango popular all over the world. So uh, in the 30s, during the 30s, tango was popular from 
from Argentina to Canada to China, Russia, everywhere. That's so interesting because actually tango is one of those like most refined now, yes. genres that you can think of, right? Now, yes, but it started as a very dangerous, you know, type of type of rhythm, not for everybody, you know, seen yeah. down, looked down upon. Yeah, that's awesome. So, how has it been the experience for you? Uh, did you grow up in Russia? You live in, you're based in Russia right now, but did you grow up there? I no, I'm actually, I'm a bit more like a gypsy, and I I'm 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 what do you call a foreigner everywhere I go. Uh, in a way, I have an I have an, a bit of an accent in every language that I speak. A little bit in Spanish, a little bit in Russian, now in, in English. Uh, for example, I left the United States about 10 years ago and I was already, I had already almost no accent. And now that I came back, I'm realizing as I speak, it's a, I still have an accent, I have to work on that. But you have an amazing accent, one of those that people are like, where are you from again? Because that happens to me as well. Like yeah. I've been in America for about 10 years. Yeah. And my accent is tricky because people can't really tell. Yes, it's like it's Hispanic maybe, but it's so soft that people don't really understand. Yeah. Yes, it's true. Uh, I have now like more of a some Russian people or Eastern European people like, oh, you're from Eastern Europe somewhere. And yes, it's true. But some of the things I say might have a Spanish uh, inflection. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to your first question. I've actually lived in different countries all of my life. There were periods in South America, there were periods in the Soviet Union just when I was born, you know. There were periods in the United States. I lived in Miami, in, in New York. Now I'm, I'm, I'm here in LA. contemplating the possibility probably in LA. Um, and so I'm what do you call a, a, a little bit of a foreigner in every land, or a bit like a chameleon in, in every land. Yeah. That's very interesting and I think as an artist that is very useful. Mm -hmm. I haven't had that many different countries that I lived in, yeah. but I grew up in Cuba, I came to America when I was like 21, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I went to Cleveland, Tennessee, Yes, in the South, which is a version of America. Yes, it's different. That is very different, which is very interesting about the US. I used to think the US was all like Hollywood and the movies and the TV shows, mm -hmm. right? Everything was like, homogeneous and yes like, because that's what you see in the movies yeah right yeah. so going to Cleveland Tennessee was like oh this is different but very interesting to me mm -hmm. then I lived in Atlanta for a few years that's Atlanta is very different from Tennessee mm -hmm. it's a different culture different people it, and it's only like two two and a half hours away yeah and you get like a different country mm -hmm. and then here in LA I have rediscovered a whole new version of America, yes. which I love. Like I love this city. Uh, I was recently in New York. I love that city too. And I think we're just so fortunate to have so many cultures and people coming together in different ways. Yes. And that feeds me as a creative because I'm in New York and it's a certain vibe that makes me think of specific ways of making things. Mm -hmm and visually like it looks a certain way and then you come here the light is different mm -hmm. the people are different the colors are different how was it for you like growing up uh not growing up going to new york to study music in the conservatory yeah and then going to all of these other places that are so Europe. different yes well in a way you have experienced m more of the united states that i have because people say every city i've been in like los angeles or new york it's like oh if you've, been, if you've been to New York, if you've lived in New York, you haven't lived in the States. It's like a different country. Or Miami, yeah, it's like a different country, you know. But you have lived in Tennessee or Atlanta where it's really more like the US. Mm -hmm. I've only lived in these, this like highlight type of places. But at the same time, I, I feel very fortunate because, you know, there's a Chinese proverb that uh, I'm going to paraphrase now, don't quote me on this one, which is basically, you live as many lives as the languages that you speak. Or you, or I would say, I would add to that, or as the cultures you have experienced. So basically, the mentality in South America is completely different from the mentality of Miami or New York or Europe in Austria where I have lived as well, or in Russia where I have lived, you know, or, or now in other countries of Eastern Europe as well. So I've been very fortunate to have experienced all of that. So could you say that again? Because I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, but know, I especially love that. in English. I love that. There's this 
ancient Chinese proverb that says, you live as many lives as the languages that you speak. That is actually very, very true. Because to me, I have like a version of Axel mm -hmm. that is Cuban. Cuban, yeah. And, and I'm a different person. And then I have a version of Axel that is like American. Yeah. I, I'm a citizen now. I love this country. Mm -hmm. I, I love America. I consider myself American. American, yeah. And you're very, very right, my friend. So in your case, you also have a Russian version to you. Of course. So I want to know more about Russia. I've never been, mm -hmm. it used to be this place because I grew up in Cuba. Yes. Russia was like the communist mother lord. So yeah. I almost didn't like Russia, mm -hmm. but then I have met some Russian people mm -hmm. and they're amazing. Like I have an uh, artist friend, Alisa, I also, okay. I actually told her about that you were coming to the podcast and she was excited. Okay. And I want to go and visit mm -hmm. uh, St. Petersburg specifically because mm -hmm. I've seen some images and it looks beautiful. Yes. Tell me about the experience of going there, living there, working there. Well, the, the Russia I have experienced and especially now that it's such a polarized country, you know, that people have such uh, dual opinions and, and uneasy feelings about what's going on currently now. However, uh, I have experienced Russia in, I would say, I, w I have experienced Russia three different countries and the same country in a way, which is, I was born in the Soviet Union. I left when I was very little, about six years old, but I still remember that time. Yeah. Which to me was the most exciting time of my life because what is the most exciting time of your life when you're a young little child? Yeah. So it's like magical to me. I, I didn't know about the politics of it, but I remember we would go uh, in summer to my grandmother's uh, village which is right now where actually the war is going on. It's like right on the border between what is now Ukraine and Russia. Mm -hmm. And I would have the most fantastic time with, uh, with the people there and uh, uh, it was great. But now, um, then I came back to Russia as a visitor after living in Colombia and South America and in the United States, such a wealthy country. Mm -hmm. In the 90s, I came back in the late 90s to Russia and I saw a country in, in shredded to pieces where people- Yeah, because that was, in, in the 90s was the bad times for Cuba was also bad times for of Russia course. because the Soviet Union just like- It, it, it ceased to exist and then and, and, and what a lot of Eastern politicians say, Russian politicians say that is not understood by the West. That, but, but why do people complain from the 90s if Russia in, during the 90s was already a democratic country? But it was right on the, on the... It was a democratic country, yes, and more, maybe more free than during Soviet Union. But this change from the Soviet Union to, to, to basically convert it into a democracy was done so abruptly and so carelessly by whoever. I mean, now we can blame, people yeah. blame all, all, all kinds of people. But it was done so carelessly that all of a sudden people were left with no social net, social security whatsoever. There were people who grew up all their lives working uh, because they knew the state would pay them. And yeah. then all of a sudden they had to make money on their own. Nobody taught them what is to be a capitalist. Yeah. They were left like, like, you know, like when you leave a, chill, chill, a child by himself, like not knowing how the world really works. Yeah. And this consumed a lot of lives. And this change was one of the harshest uh, that, have ex uh, that, have, that a country has gone through. Uh, and so I came back during the 90s and I saw this and I said, wow, Russia is such a poor country, so terrible. Yeah. Then when I came back this third time, when I started working there a little bit uh, and get invited for concerts, it was a country on the rise because of uh, uh, high, uh, high oil um, prices and gas prices. Basically, more people started having more money. The middle class was somewhat growing. And then I saw the, a little bit of the opulence, the luxury that was a bit reminiscent maybe of the Russian empire, even yeah. before the revolution, you saw people, you know, walking more proudly and all of this. And now again, the war, you know, the confusion and all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, all I have to say is they're the nicest people in the world. You know, it's, yeah. it's always problems that, that go on top. You know, it all, it's always like they say, it's a cliche phrase, but it's like old men, you know, sending young men to war, basically. Uh, and they're not the ones sacrificing themselves. So that's, that's the sad part. But the people are great. Mm, they, they seem very somber in many ways. Mm -hmm. But once you get to know them, they, you have a friend for life. 
they're very honest. Uh, they're very good artists. You know, they're yeah. very disciplined. Um, and I just hope the best for both Russia and Ukraine, yeah. which I have family in both countries. For me personally, it's a tragedy. It's been a tragedy for years because this conflict did not start this year. Mm -hmm. uh, already my family wasn't speaking to each other for years, you know. And so I just hope this, is, this, is, this ends well. The only thing that disappoints me is that actually we humans don't learn. That's, that's the only, we don't, we think that we have learned something from the Second World War, from the Napoleonic Wars, you know, but no, we have not, because it's a cycle, it repeats. Yeah. That's the only disappointing part. You mentioned that in Russia they have some of the best artists, and in film specifically, it's more of the art that I know, mm -hmm. because they were pioneers mm -hmm. in the actual deep understanding of storytelling. Yes. I think America created film. Mm -hmm. Russia, like Russian filmmakers perfected it mm -hmm. to a deeper level. Mm -hmm. So you were mentioning that your dad was also a filmmaker and he was around yeah. the time of Tarkovsky and yeah. all those people. He was a bit younger. He was a few years younger than Tarkovsky. But when he was studying there, he, he studied with the, pretty much the same teachers, you know, yes. pretty much the same... Uh, environment Tarkovsky himself would come around you know and then and, and give uh, just hang out or give master classes or whatever he was already by the time my dad was studying Tarkovsky was already starting to I think he had done already Andrei Rublev which is like his big, uh, his big piece. hit yeah, yeah. Uh, his first big <clears throat> big masterpiece and um, so in that sense yes I can say my dad received some of the best education in the world and that's why even though, I don't want to brag about my dad now, but even though if I tell you his name, nobody's going to know it, probably, especially in English. But if I tell you his work, even though he now works in this not such a big country in South America, which is called Colombia, that not many people know aside from the obvious, you know, things, his work is famous around the world. And, uh, uh, and he's proud of that. That's amazing. And that's because he says it many times in interviews and whenever he's asked, that is because of that strong Soviet school of filmmaking. That, uh, that uh, dynasty uh, that started with Stanislavski, with Eisenstein, with, you know, continue with other greats like uh, Shukshin, Tarkovsky, you know. This is a great tradition. Many of them actually came to America, you know. The, te the acting technique that we know here as the method, yeah. which is so well practiced. In reality, if you start, I mean, I, maybe more, some people would disagree with me, but if you actually start um, unraveling it, it is actually the Stanislavski technique. Mm -hmm. That Strasberg, I studied, for example, at the Lee Strasberg Institute, Strasberg basically took that technique and made it more efficient. But in essence, to me, it's pretty much the, the same essence method yeah yeah it's like in singing you can you can uh, you can experiment with many techniques but to learn how to breathe the essence you know is only one because people have similar throats and you know similar breathing systems so that's like the essence that's Stanislavski right I remember watching Ivan's childhood yes that's my favorite Tarkovsky yes. movie when I saw that film I was like oh my god Yes. It was one of the first times that I experienced film to a deeper level mm -hmm. because I love commercial movies. Like I yes. grew up watching all the Hollywood movies, of course. Like big and action kid, movies, like The Terminator, that. all of that. Like I love that. But then when I started learning more about film and studying film, mm -hmm. I took a, a film class with a professor called Armando in Havana. Yeah. And that's about the time that I started watching those films. Mm -hmm. and. I felt compelled to dedicate my life to telling stories in part because when I watched that movie, I was like, this is so deep that if I could ever create something that moves people the way that this moved me, yeah. I could die a happy person. Yes. Like I could die a happy man. Yes. And I think it probably happens the same. I, I'm curious to know how did it click for you with music mm -hmm. because I, I've seen videos of your performances and you can tell, like, you just watch and it's like, yeah, yeah, he, he is that. When did that occur to you? Uh, you mean that, uh, that compelling moment? 
that turning moment when you realize this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life and I could die a yeah. happy man if I can do this. Yes. Uh, there was no, there were several moments I would say. There was no one moment that is like, okay, this is what I want to do. Because I got started in music very early at five years old playing the cello. But I noticed now, then I played the guitar a little bit, and then I noticed myself, even since five years old, when I was playing the cello, I accompanied uh, uh, the playing while singing. I was singing while playing, always. I accompanied my playing with singing, always. I don't know why, it was always like that. And then the singing just felt natural, and I kept doing it, kept doing it. But one moment, I have to say, that compelling moment, my dad, I was in South America and he bought a CD back then with the CDs. <laughs> he bought a CD of Pavarotti, which was a great tenor, Luciano Pavarotti. Pavarotti is like in yeah. Cuba we used to watch Pavarotti yeah. all the time. It's like Yeah, I mean everybody does. Best. Everybody does and he became so commercial and you know you say Pavarotti it's like oh pff. especially opera singers like oh Pavarotti Pavarotti you know everybody talks about Pavarotti there's so many other great ones you know that people don't know. So what? He was still the great. I think he is the greatest, like one of the greatest. Singer, yes, yes. Like most, I guess the most well recognized. Yes, and one of the great things he did is that he popularized opera in many ways. So people, you know, those concerts that he did with uh, Eros Ramazzotti, yeah. Zucchero, like other like great singers, uh, Michael Bolton, I think. Yeah. He sang with them, and then they, people said, what a great voice. And then they started listening to his other classical things. So they fell in love with opera through that, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, when my dad, I was about 13 years old, 14, and he bought this CD, and I put it on, and I heard his voice. I, to me, I have to be honest, I felt jealous. I felt jealous. I said, wow, how can God give someone such a sound you know that it's like impossible to make uh, genuinely jealous for the first time for something very uh, very private which is my love of of music i always liked to sing before and, and around my friends i was the one who expressed himself vocally the most but when i was confronted with such mastery that seems almost otherworldly I, I said to myself, uh, I kind of was disappointed because I said, well, probably God gave him that talent and nobody has that except from him or maybe a few other people. And if I had that, of course I would sound like that, but I could never have that. And then about a year after, somebody told me, because I told him well, one of my favorite singers is Pavarotti, and he's like, well, and don't you, wouldn't you like to sing? You also like singing. And I said, yeah, but I will never... Like, I, I, I could never learn how to sing like that. Like, that's impossible. And this person told me, no. Yes, he might have a great talent, but if you study, there's a way to study this technique, the bel canto technique, which is bel canto in Italian means singing beautifully. Uh -huh. It's a special technique with the breathing. And all. If you study this and if you study hard, I don't know if you, they said, I don't know if you could sound like him, but you will sound it with a similar approach of him. How you know, old were time. you when that happened? I was 14, 15 years old. When this person, a friend of my dad, told me this, my, I mean, my whole being lit up. I said, really, you could learn how to do this? Yes, yeah, sure. And then I started looking for lessons. And I guess that, that's what, that was the point, the turning point for me to really start studying music and to f basically, I, then I fell in love with classical music, with opera and everything that has to do with it which is not what I do now, which is a different conversation. Yeah. Maybe we could touch upon that later. But uh, that was the initial, mm, the initial like bite, the yeah. initial infection, you know, where it basically it all started, yeah. So what are you doing now? Now I do crossover music, which is, uh, it was, it's with this operatic style, maybe more of a classical approach, but more contemporary things. So the most, popular analogy that most people could have is if they know Andrea Bocelli, yeah. he's a very famous, also classical tenor, but a more of a crossover singer because he sings more popular things yeah. in a more classical style. Except he's a tenor, 
and I'm a lower voice type, which is a baritone. Okay. But the repertoire that we both sing is pretty much the same. Similar. And also our, our fees are a little bit different. <laughs> but <laughs> we need to change that. Yeah. But it is pretty much um, similar repertoire. And it is with this classical approach. Yeah. And I, st I do have to say, I have to be honest with uh, myself and with everybody. I enjoy singing uh, the songs. I enjoy singing uh, even more popular things and smooth jazz. I love it. However, my love still remains opera, even though I almost don't sing it. Uh, even for the concerts that I do, which is two hours of like more pop stuff uh, with orchestra and everything, but like more, uh, let's say, popular. Yeah. I still warm up and prepare only singing classical. That's crazy. Yeah. And I guess that's what gives me the edge in, in many ways, uh -huh. because opera and that bel canto style is, is the maximum expression of the human voice. And so once you do that, the other things become... Not, no, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, like once I start getting into the styles of smooth jazz or, or blues or even pop songs or other genres, there are so many masters that, I mean, it's amazing, like my admiration to them. But in terms of singing technique per se, of course, opera is the, the top, the, the hardest to achieve. Um, it's like, you know, it's, it, it, once you make it, it's just, it's like you're driving a Ferrari, you know what I mean? It's, that's the difference, yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. I honestly don't listen to opera, mm -hmm. uh, but I do love Andrea Bocelli. Yeah. Uh, he has this album thing, Love in Portofino. Oh, yeah, it's wonderful. Beautiful yeah, album. Beautiful. Like you, you put that on and it's like... Easy listening and yeah. it's smooth voice. It's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. So why do you think with opera, it's very hard to make opera like commercial nowadays. Yes. And, like music has gone through, the music industry has gone through an entire like re reimagining mm -hmm. in the last 10 years mm -hmm. with everything that happened with social media and all that. Mm -hmm. So I honestly don't know, yes. but I would assume that opera is very hard to sell. It's, it is. But it's not that many people would say, that understand yeah, that understanding it is like, you know, like you're not in the shower listening to that. Although people like to sing opera in the shower. In the shower, yeah. Enough, yeah. <laughs> all that stuff. But like, um, the, the thing with opera, I mean, it's actually, it's understandable why people don't, don't get it because you're singing in a foreign language, yeah. uh, Italian, Russian, German, you know, about a time period that it was three centuries ago with wigs that people don't wear right now, uh, about topics and gods that don't exist anymore. And so when you are confronted with that uh, if you don't understand it it's hard to appreciate so it's totally understandable and that's why it's all it's always been an elitist type of art form mm -hmm. however there has been many um, attempts to make it more popular I myself when I stu when I studied in Manhattan School of Music we used to go out to schools for children and 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 make and you know choose operas like The Magic Flute by Mozart, which is like for children and, you know, teach, sing it in English, translate it into English from German and sing it to the children and be like, look, opera is so cool. And like, there's this guy who wears feathers. His name is Papageno and he's, he's in love with Papagena. And this is their duet, pa, 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 pa. And like, like kids love it, you know? But at the same time, you need to feed it. Uh, and if you don't, once you get bitten by the infectious mosquito of opera, I mean, there's no way back. That's it. You're, you're done, you know. But in order to get there, it requires education. It requires time. It requires a specific understanding. Now people, for some reason, for one, in one way or another, they're moving further and further away from it. It is also, the other aspect is a very costly art form because you need a hundred people orchestra. You need to pay all of them. They're high quality professional musicians. You need singers who are, who need to be amazing. You need a conductor, you need a hall, you need a place where, where, where all this happens. Uh, and the audience could never cover that. So you need sponsorship. So in order to make a project like that, it's so much money to invest and you get out of it almost nothing except the enjoyment of it. That's the problem with, with opera, yeah. I would say. 
But it's probably, as music goes, it's probably one of the highest forms of that art. Yes, yes. Have you found that it's easier to do that in Russia because of the tradition in the arts compared to the US? Yes, of course. And not only in Russia, there's Germany, for example. It's now the country that supports opera the most. Even in Italy, which is the birthplace of opera, uh, they're struggling right now a lot. Uh, from what I know from the colleagues that really sing opera full time, they say that the thank God for places like Germany, Austria, Switzerland, you know, because these are the places that support opera that have orchestra, like uh, for example, I think Germany has close to a hundred and something orchestras that are professional in the country. Wow. That basically play uh, every day. This is like, and people go every day. So, and this is all, uh, this is all sponsored by the government. Not every country has that luxury. In America, for example, it's all private mostly, you know. Yeah. Government supports, but it's mostly private. Uh, so, um, Germany, Russia, yes, they understand this, but at the same time, popular music always wins. The ver I tell you right now, the American version of opera is musical. Why? Because it's closer to the people. Yeah. Because it's in English. Uh, yes, the style is different, people sing different now, but the essence is the same. It's very tragic sometimes. Sometimes it's more light on the light side, you know. Mm -hmm. But it it is the opera of America, which is the musical, which yeah. has also evolved. Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, exposed to classical music uh, while I was in college. Yeah. Because I was filming this series of concerts called String Theory, mm -hmm. and it was very interesting. It was a museum in in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and they would yeah. bring the most amazing musicians from all over the world. Wow to come and perform mm -hmm. and like like you said the price of admission was like very cheap yeah the audience was always full mm -hmm. because i i guess like the most elite people you could call yeah. in the city yeah like it was usually like older people yes yes that will come to enjoy that type of music mm -hmm. and i was so amazed by the ability of the musicians i was like how in the world can they perform? It sounded like a record. Yeah. No flaws, no problem. Yeah. But to be honest, like after like 40 minutes of it, you get kind of like yes. tired yes. of listening to such intense, mm -hmm. and it was just music. This didn't have, I think if Voice you were there exactly. singing, it would be a lot easier. Yeah. What do you think could be the bridge between that highest level of music mm -hmm. and popular to bring something somewhat in the middle, because mm -hmm. I, I think that's where you should go if mm -hmm. that's going to be somewhat the future. Yes. Well, you know, back in the day, centuries ago, music was just another language you sp spoke. You see, for example, uh, people back in the day, especially in Europe, you know, the because high, not only high society actually, they spoke, you know, French, you know, maybe Italian, German. And they also play piano, for example, a little bit. So to learn the notes, to learn the music, is like another language. And for example, people that know music, that know how to read it, know how to play piano a little bit, they understand that concert of only music a little bit more. And so they see the patterns in the music. To them, it's fun, it's stimulating in the brain. But people who have not been exposed to it, maybe they feel, oh, it's a bit, you know, a bit boring, just because they have not been exposed to it uh, that much. Uh, and so I think, of course, a big part of it is education. That's education from an early age. If, you, if one is not exposed to music from an early age, it's like, oh, that sounds cool, interesting, because of the instruments and everything. But you know, I don't speak that language. But if you speak that language from childhood, then it is more stimulating to you. And, and then music, that type of enjoyment can never depart you. You always will want to, even if once a year, you would want to go to a classical music concert because it's just so cool. Yeah. But it's, it's a matter of feeding it from an early age, I think. That's very interesting. To me, I have a close relationship to music, mm -hmm. also because of film. Yes. So yes. I live my life with a soundtrack almost 24 seven. I, yeah. I have music in the car, music in the shower, not so much when I go to sleep, but I used to go to sleep like listening to music. Uh -huh. What has been your experience with film? Wow, that's interesting. I, in a way, sometimes I think, why am I a singer? Maybe I should have been a, like some, some, maybe I should have done something within the movie industry. 
because my mom is an actress. She was quite successful in the Soviet Union. She was quite famous. Uh, my dad also achieved a, a certain type of success in the movie, not movie, but series. He does more series, mm -hmm. uh, but in filmmaking as well. And I, I followed them from early childhood. Like I was in the movie sets. I remember my dad, my mom this, did this Ukrainian movie. And I was there with her uh, for months, you know, watching how people were filming everything with the actors. I took lessons with my mom. Then with my dad, I would follow him also in the movie set the whole time. I knew why he puts cameras in a certain place. I, know, I knew why he tells the actors to do this and that. So in a way, even though I never studied this, as from a director's perspective, for example, when my sister says, oh, I need to do this audition or like somebody's talking about this, I'd be like, oh, why don't you do it like this, you know? And, and then I think to myself, where did that come from? Like, how did I know this, you know? And it's because in a way, you know how like, the son of someone who's a director also becomes a director and all of that and somehow through generations they become better and better yeah um and sometimes i think my god maybe i should have done that but at the same time uh i mean music is such a lovely thing maybe you should direct a musical yeah that, actually i was thinking um when i when i sang even when i sang opera a little bit uh, in like summer programs or student um student uh, festival, how do you call it, how do you call it? young artist programs, it's what you call it in opera. Um, I was as an actor, as an opera performer, but always on stage, always I was in my mind criticizing the director, why doesn't he do this instead of doing that? This is not readable to the audience, this would read so much better. Of course I keep quiet because I'm just the guy that's supposed to sing his lines and do whatever the director says, but I always, not always, but sometimes I gave directors like a hard time. Like, but why? Why not this, you know? The, and so, um, yeah, that's the, my frustration a little bit. I would love to direct maybe a, 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 either a musical or, or an opera. Um, but maybe, maybe in the future, I don't know. It's, it's one of those projects that it does not give back in terms of money so much. It's something you do more for, for enjoyment. Yeah. Very few people are able to do it and earn and live well uh, through that profession alone. Yeah. So let's talk about money. If, yeah. if we're going to talk somewhat about money, I think sure. that's one of the hardest things in the arts. Yes. Yes. Because as we know, you could be the most amazing artist in any yeah. different uh, disciplines and you could still come out like broke. Yes. What has been your experience with that? And like, we don't need to get into any details. No, no, no. It's, it's, I'm just curious yeah. because I don't think artists talk enough about money. Oh, yes, that's true. Usually people will tell you, oh, it shouldn't be about the money. You have to follow your passion yeah. and do this and do that. I think that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. I think as an artist, we need to care as much as about the business side mm -hmm. as we care about yes. the art side because one feeds into the other. Yes, which I think is, it is what it is, but I think it's unfortunate because... I've had the experience, my dad, for example, had the experience of studying when the state basically sponsors everything and you only need to think about creating. But those times are over. Even Tarkovsky himself said uh, that the movie industry as a pure art form is over. He said this in the 70s. Because he says now, and this is in the 70s, he's speaking like... He said 50 because, years ago. Yeah, because he said now, unfortunately, you before you even make the idea of this movie, like you say, oh, it's gonna be a great idea, or it's gonna be something philosophical. No, 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 your priority number one is, you have to tell the sponsors, look, this movie's gonna cost so much, but it's gonna make you this much. And he said, right there, that's the death of art. I mean, he was very categorical about it, you know, it's Tarkovsky, he's like, but at the same time, he's, he's right in many ways. But I, to that question, I have a, another question. <laughs> which is, um, how do you call the worst student who graduated from law school in Harvard? How do you call him? A lawyer. A lawyer. And I, I mean, I'm not to, not to uh, how do you say, uh, um, put down any lawyers or you know, other people that have these great professions, but if you graduate as a lawyer, you can hang that diploma in your office and you're a lawyer. 
you know, and you're going to receive clients. And maybe you're not going to be the best, but you're still going to make money. As a musician, you can graduate from the best places in the world. I graduated from one of the best conservatories in the world. Manhattan School of Music is just like Juilliard or any other, you know, in, in, in America. Um, I can hang that diploma in the bathroom. <laughs> Nobody cares. Why? Yeah. Because... Yes, of course, if I mention it to people that know music, like, oh, that's a great school. But at the same time, when you get up on that stage, nobody says, oh, no wonder he graduated from this school. They're, gonna be, they're always going to compare you with the best of the best. And I still now in my YouTube channel, I get comments because I sing a lot of covers. Because for me, the voice is the most important thing. I don't sing my own music like a lot of musicians. Mm -hmm. For me, it's the art of singing something that has been written before, which I enjoyed from opera and now I'm doing it in, in, in song. But now a lot of people say, um, oh, they write, he sings good, but it's not like this singer from the past. You'll never compare, you know, because they always have this image mm -hmm. of someone else doing that. And it doesn't matter what type of diploma you have. So you have to be great at making money. You have to be great at, at uh, promoting yourself. You have to be one of the best to make any ma money uh, at it. You really have to be good. Mm -hmm. Unlike maybe other professions where you can, I'm sorry, but it's true, you can be not so great, maybe a bit mediocre, but still earn uh, some type of wage. I think that's the difference. What do you think has been the biggest difference from what you had in mind for your career when you were at the conservatory mm -hmm. compared to the reality of being an artist? Yeah. This, wa this is one of those great lessons uh, in life, you know, those big epiphanies that you have, uh, which is my dad, my dad told me once, like I said before, he, you might not know his name, but you might know his works. And it's because he's done, he's tried to do the best that he can at whatever he does. So he told me once, and it was very random, I, I don't know exactly why he said this, but we were doing something completely unrelated to, to art or anything. We weren't even talking. I think he was cooking. And then he said, you know, son, he said, a lot of people, gurus, say you should uh, do what you love. You know, everybody, you should do what you love because that's the only way, you know, you can keep doing it. And he said, you know what I learned in this life? He said, I think sometimes you have to love what you do. And that, first, I, that question bothered, that statement by my dad bothered me because my, mm, my fixation of what I wanted was so specific, but also at that time I think so closed-minded that it did not even allow me to broaden my view on what life could bring to me and what other possibilities I had, actually talents that were much greater than this focus that I had, which was just maybe a big part of it being, being stubborn, you know? Uh, and that's true because my dad told me, he said, I've made movies and I've made good movies. And the movie he's made, it, it won the award of the most memorable movie in the country of all history in Colombia, you know? But he says, then there was no money for movies. There was no sponsorship. So I started making soap operas or series because I had to feed you, like feed the children. <laughs> But I tried to do the best that I could at that. And because that's the only way, the only thing that existed. But he did it so well that the one series he did, for example, is famous throughout the world. And it's the most watched series in the history of humanity. I think only Game of Thrones beat it. What's, what is it called? This is Betty Ugly or Ugly Betty. Did your dad did Ugly Betty? He did Ugly Betty, the original, the original version. Colombian version. He was the director of that. That's awesome. Yeah, and and you know what's awesome about it? It's like a lot of people haven't watched it, but then I, I watched the American version. The American version. That was like based in New York and all that. Yeah, well, Salma Hayek came to Colombia to, to interview the people to like, I, I don't know if she met with my dad or not, but basically like she bought the series and she, she made a remake here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and my dad said, and I, I was like, really is it the most fair? and I looked it up Wikipedia this was before Game of Thrones so I don't know yeah. but it says Betty Ugly the most seen series uh, TV series in the world through different productions or the same series watched everywhere you know translated into other languages yeah. and uh, underneath it says director 
Mario Rivero. And I was like, my God, you know? And so to me, with me, with music, it happened the same way. I was in Germany and uh, a very wise person told me, he's a great singer and a great professor. And he said, Dimitri, listen, if you really try hard, because you don't have like, you have a good melodic voice, you have good taste in music, and you have a beautiful voice. But if you tr really try hard, like your voice is not that big, you know, talent, which is huge people that look like closets, they open their mouth and they blow away the walls. That's not your voice, he said. And, and with, it, to you, it's going to be harder. But if you try really hard, you can work at a regional house in Germany, like a good opera house, and you're going to be their main, like their baritone, for example, that, that's going to do many roles and stuff like that. But if you utilize your many languages that you speak, if you utilize those many cultures that you've been exposed to, that talent of the voice that you have, you're not going to be the baritone of the house. You're going to be Dimitri Ribeiro. So you got to choose. And that's the moment that I remember my dad's comment. I said, wow, maybe I should think about that. And that's when I started singing more in Eastern Europe and Europe in general. In Russia, I was invited a lot as well. And, um, and just, just opened up my world and opened up my mind that I don't have to leave this classical approach that I have. And yet I can make more people enjoy this music instead of being so strictly adhered to this classical thing, which by the way, uh, it's very hard to do. It's like an athlete, you, you have to be, uh, you know, always on top for that, for very little recognition. And this approach that I'm having now, I hope, and it's already giving some results. It is, it is more, how to say, uh, more popular in a way. And it gives me more enjoyment in, in some ways as well. That's incredible. So Dimitri, if you could do anything in life, mm -hmm. time is no issue, money is no issue. Wow, one of those questions, that's so cool. Okay. What, would be, <laughs> what would it be? Yeah. Anything in life. Wow, that's, that's, that, that, that awakens a lot of things. Um, perfect my voice as much as I can until it's like, it's like so amazing. Because you never stop. I mean, it's a bit, probably a bit selfish, but since we're just talking about profession. Just about you. Yeah, yeah it's just about a profession, that would be it. If, if we talk about life in general, yeah. that's, a di that's a whole different. What would that be? Uh, it's like one of those questions like, if you knew you had only like five months to live, you know what? Exactly. Would be? Mm. I would put other people as priority because we always are selfish. We prioritize ourselves, which in this art is so much needed. But we have to step out and think maybe that um, this is just one facet of life. That life is so much bigger than this pursuit of um, something that that's, even if an art form is, is, is a bit selfish, you know, I think. That's great. So before we end the interview, mm -hmm. would you sing something? Oh my God. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, when, when I'm asked that question, it's like, um, uh, there are so many like tunes that go through my mind. I don't know what to do, like which one? What about Roxanne? <laughs> we talked about Roxanne. Well, Roxanne is more of like a scene. Okay. So it's just an episode. But well, give me anything that you but, uh, want to close. I mean, I guess this next thing is, uh, is a no-brainer because it's the most performed song in all of history. <laughs> okay. It's Besame Mucho, which is Kiss Me A Lot. This, uh, I think it's, it's a Mexican song, composed by a 16-year-old girl, by the way. No way. Yeah. So just, just as a little, you know, little yeah. tune, nothing special. <clears throat> well, to the, all the... Ladies or all the lovers out there. <laughs> bésame, bésame mucho, como si fuera esta noche la última vez. Bésame mucho, que tengo miedo tenerte. Y perderte después. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It was very special for me. And again, we'll see you in another one.